Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today uh, to speak, Prof. Uh, this is the first time I've been to this campus and uh, it's very large. <laughs> so, quite impressed by the size of it. I don't live so far away. I'm in Puchong. Uh, I used to work with Matt um, and uh, we were building a lot of the things that I'm talking about today uh, with you, right? So, I'm told that 4.30 is an absolute sacred hour. So, we must finish by then. So we will be doing that. Uh, hopefully I'll give like maybe 15 minutes or so at the end for uh, questions. Um, so when Matt gave me this topic, right, uh, the role of 4.0 in developing national economies. Um, oh, I'm running off the side of the screen. Okay, 4.0. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll... I'll I'll, I'll give you a, a lowdown. Why, why I put my, my credentials up there is just to kind of give you a feel, right? What is it that I'm doing? So, uh, at the, as a start, um, as introduced at the beginning, I'm an aerospace engineer. So, what do I do? I'm actually a stress engineer. So, stress is part of my job description, right? So, what do I do? I actually do calculations for sizing aircraft components. And I, I did that out of university. I worked in the Airbus supply chain for about 10 years in the UK. Um, oh, so that's not improving. Okay. So, um, and, um, and then I built the company over here, which was outsourcing work from the UK to Malaysia. So, uh, I'll show you parts that are made in Malaysia on Airbus aircraft uh, in, in a second, you know. So, I hope that fills you with confidence getting on planes you know, going forward. So, um, I also serve as the president of the Malaysian Aerospace Industry Association, which I started um, uh, in, sort of in partnership, you can, can say that, with... Uh, Datuk Sri Mustafa Muhammad, today the Economic um, Minister of Economic Affairs, right? Or Economic Planning Unit Minister. Uh, that was in 2016. I am now in my third term. We have 90 members, uh, including the large companies, uh, General Electric, you know, uh, Safran, uh, um, Spirit Aerosystems, global companies, right? And then all the way down to little SMEs. Right, Malaysian companies. So there are about 90 companies, of which maybe 50 of them are SMEs. Okay, so we export nearly about 16.4 uh, billion ringgit every year in aircraft parts and services. Right, so Malaysia doesn't make a plane, so everything we do is export. Right, so I am a design engineer and stress design engineer. So what I was doing at the start was developing engineers to be able to tell white people on the other side of the world what to do, right? So I like to explain it like that because it's a reversal of roles, if you like, right? So the thinking done here, the doing and the building done in, in Europe, right? So um, the, the association uh, is also home to uh, a lot, a few institutions as well, uh, and we are growing every year, okay? The, uh, the other few uh, positions that I hold there, I hope the other slides are not going to be cropped, so <laughs> it's going to be challenging then. Um, I'm a committee member of Pemuda, which is, um, I've got to read it here, it's a bit of a mouthful. Pasukan Petugas Khas Pemuda Cara Penyagaan. Okay, so actually it's a committee that is chaired by the uh, Ketua Setia Usaha Negara, the State Secretary. Right? and uh, the presidents of the different uh, industry associations. So I have the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, Aerospace Industry Association, Food and Beverage Industry, and so on and so forth. So effectively, it's almost like a lobby organization. Right? Its job is to make government uh, change policy where it's needed. So we work quite, quite heavily on policy change and uh, regulatory changes. Uh, so that gives me a front seat with quite a few things because I'm also the council member for the National Science Council. That's what that says, right? Uh, so that's chaired by the Prime Minister. Um, the National Aerospace Council, chaired by the Economics Minister. The Malaysian Aerospace, uh, sorry, the National Metrology Council, uh, which is chaired by SIRIM. The National Aerospace Council and the Selangor Aerospace Council, right? So I've been busy being on councils. I actually do do work sometimes. Otherwise, uh, most of the time, I'm there to help push the industry's uh, growth, okay? So, industry uh, 4.0, I'll put this slide up, okay, at least this one's come down, right? Um, is there an economics department here? No? There isn't one? No, okay. So maybe this person might be a little bit uh, unfamiliar to you, but Joseph Schumpeter is an economist which has come back in vogue now. 
Right? They came up with the theory of creative destruction. And what is creative destruction is that um, innovation and entrepreneurship destroys value as a, as a matter of cost. That's what it does. Right? Every time you think you've created something new, an entrepreneur will come along with some technology and try and reduce your ability to sell that for a margin. Yeah. And this is the cycle that is going round and round now at a far, much faster pace. What's interesting is that Schumpeter saw this in 1945, right? So this is actually the foundation of Industry 4.0. It's this very rapid disruption that's happening now, enabled by technology. So I was with my niece, who's at uh, Nottingham University, uh, Malaysia campus, uh, at the weekend. And she says, oh, I've got to chair a, a panel session on Industry 4.0. Uncle, what is Industry 4.0? So, <laughs> I'm guessing there's a lot of millennials who actually have no clue <laughs> what is Industry 4.0. It's all the old guys who are actually talking about it, right? Because maybe for, for some of the youngsters, Industry 4.0 is something you live in, right? You don't notice it. We notice the change, right? So, when I was young, you know, I was just at that point where TV went from black and white to color. First Queen Tricks TV, right? So... Uh, Gen X, right? Now, today, uh, you know, my kids don't really know how to interact apart from touch uh, the screen and so on and so forth. No, touch screen was nothing in our, in our age. There's no such thing as a touch screen, right? So the fourth industrial revolution, I find, is uh, something that needs to be explained. Actually, it was a brand. It was actually a brand done by Siemens for Angela Merkel, right? So it's a German thing. And what they tried to do is put a line in the sand where 3.0 became something else, right? So 1.0, as you know, is a, a mechanization, and then 2.0 is the assembly line, right? Uh, so uh, mass production. And then 3.0 is automation. And 4.0 is this mass connectivity, which, like I said, millennials, you're born into it. You're all mass connected, right? From day one. You don't know any other way but to be connected. Right. Uh, so, uh, for us, you know, when I was a kid, you know, connected means you have to pick up the phone with the twirly line and dial a number, right? That's connecting, right? So, with this mass connection, this disruption that we see here um, is now on an exponential curve, okay? So, what has government and economies got to do with it? Well, to be honest, uh, in all my roles, I, will, I help uh, draft the, uh, some chapters of the 12th Malaysia Plan. Uh, to do with aerospace and industry 4.0, I helped write the national aerospace 4.0 blue. Uh, sorry, the national 4.0 policy framework, which is at the economic planning unit level, right? Um, so that document over there, and that document over there, right? So these are the documents that you might not be aware of. You can download them from the internet, and you'll see these diagrams. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, we can only see half of the, <laughs> the screen. So okay. So, um, you see here, I mean, just as well, on the left-hand side, you see how governments see the world, right? Balanced, responsible, sustainable growth. It's a very broad statement of intent, right? And then it tries to drill it down here to equip Rakyat with four IR knowledge and skill sets, forge connected nation through digital infrastructure development, future-proof regulations to be agile technology changes, uh, accelerate four IR technology innovation and adoption. Right? Okay, so in my business, that's called a motherhood statement. Right? What does that mean? It's a very high level statement. Right? That, uh, it's a very high level statement that you can't actually implement per se. You can aspire to, but what is that actually, actually going to be doing? Right? So, actually, the person who knows how to do this is right here in the corner. Can you see that? That's PricewaterhouseCoopers. That's the organization that was contracted to write this document. Okay, so how does it work uh, in government today? Uh, in most governments, uh, you have consultants that will come in, McKinsey, PwC, Ernst & Young, all these guys, they will come in. They will pitch their uh, capability to an economics ministry, right? in our case, the Economic Planning Unit, and then it will say, okay, um, we will help you write your 4.0 strategy. Okay, so that's how it actually works. So, all right. So while he's doing that, 
Okay. So, um, so that's how it actually works. Now, um, the challenge with that is uh, the government um, structures that are supporting this strategy do not work like this. All right. So, if you see inside these uh, plans and these uh, uh, strategies, you will see transformation requirements on the government itself. Right. So it. It tells the government. It tells the government itself how it needs to change to be 4.0 already, and there are things that the government has to do to be able to respond to the kind of things that the um, the industry is needing for the government to be able to do. Right? Is that working? <laughs> okay. So um, if we if we look at it in that way, then the government is struggling as much as you are with Industry 4.0. That's my bottom line point, right? That's the actual fact. That, and it's not just the Malaysian government. So I did uh, the Selangor State Industry 4.0 blueprint as well. I started the work under Datuk Sri Azmin Ali, then now uh, Datuk uh, Amiruddin, Datuk Sri Amiruddin. The, um, the 4.0 uh, implementation plans of the state and the federal government, oh, it's very distracting. Yeah? So the 4.0 implementation plans and strategies of the state and federal government are now slowly getting aligned, right? But in the alignment of these plans, there's a lot of gaps in what it is that uh, we have to be able to do to be able to implement or to realize anything. So I'll give you an, a case of education. Right, so education, industry 4.0, right? So I was coming up the lift with some lovely ladies just now, they didn't realize I was a speaker, and I was asking them, do you know what they're talking about today? Right, and uh, this is something about business and economics, right? So um, I think the connection between uh, business, economics, and industry 4.0 is very tenuous at the moment. I don't think anybody really understands this connection. The key thing that I can give you is that the industry is changing at such a rapid pace that its business models now are no longer um, these business models now are no longer something which it can depend on for a long period. So what does that mean, right? It's very difficult now for me to write a ten-year business plan, right? Five-year business plan is almost there, not there, right? So I'm looking at a change that's happening every two to three years, right? So that's all. It's fine. So every two to three years, I will have something change in my business which might change my business model, right? So um, if you look at the sectors that are being focused on by the government, right? We have manufacturing, transportation, logistics, healthcare, education, agriculture, utilities, finance, insurance, professional scientific, technical services, wholesale, retail, trade, tourism. It's everything under the sun, right? It's everything. Everything needs to change. Everything needs to have a 4.0 uh, solution to it. Right? So, it's something where the government still is trying to figure out where exactly to focus. Because we don't know which one is going to become the next thing that will drive. Right? So, if you look, there's actually only two prioritized industries in the uh, 12th Malaysia Plan. The first is the electronics and electrical industry. The second is the aerospace industry. All right? uh, so, you know who's responsible for that. Because... The, for, the, the idea behind the aerospace industry is that it will be an industry where you will figure out how to do everything else. So, human capital development in uh, so education uh, in aerospace, right? Our biggest challenge um, educating people for technician level up to sort of uh, engineer or management level is the fact that <coughs> the institutions that we work with generally do not have a context or industry. Right. So what does that mean? At the technician level, if I say um, skill level 1 and 2, SKM level 1 and 2, right? those are the low level skill sets, and then you have 3 and then diploma. Okay? The SKM 1, 2 level, it should be standardized throughout the country. And it is, as far as the certificate is concerned. But if I get someone, uh, let's like say a welder or something like that, trained in KL versus a welder that is trained in Kota Baru, they may fail, hold the same certificate, but they will not necessarily be able to do the same thing. Right? That, that's a major issue. Right? So an aerospace company which looks at the highest level of compliance, if we cannot get 
what we need as a raw material of human capital, we will have to invest in the development of that. So what you find today is that we are building our own apprenticeship methodologies within our organizations, right? Separate to the institutions. So that, that is a major challenge because it's a cost that we shouldn't be bearing. So that is a simple articulation of an education challenge for 4.0 industry. Yeah? Because any industry that's going to industry 4.0 will have the complexity of aerospace. So what does that mean? Complexity of aerospace means that the product itself, most of the time, is not a uh, consumer product. You don't buy the product, right? Somebody leases the product, and the product is used for a very long time. So how long do you think an aircraft is uh, built to last for? Any guesses? <laughs> 25 plus years, okay? And if you look at your Air Asia aircraft that you, you get into, as soon as it lands, somebody cleans it out, 45 minutes later, it's off again. Okay? So this cycle happens for 25 plus years. So if you did that to your car, it will be condemned, I think, within a few months. Right? If you never stop using it. Right? But here's a plane that you get on and then go into the sky and trust that it's okay. Right? So you'd be interested to know that you know, we calculate that there are cracks all over the plane. Yeah, we designed the plane to have cracks. It's called damage tolerant. Yeah? And what we do is we calculate the speed at which these cracks will grow. And that is your interval for maintaining the plane. How often do you have to look at the plane is how often do you think the crack will grow to a point where it's going to be a problem. So this is how you actually design a plane, a, a, a vehicle that can go for 25 plus years. Okay? So it's quite scary if you think about it that way, right? <laughs> I'm just trying to wake you up. <laughs> end of the day. So um, the, uh, the, the idea behind uh, a product like that is that um, you will not need to own it. And this is what Elon Musk is actually targeting. If you look at the valuation of Elon Musk by a company called Ark Invest, which is the main investor in Tesla, right? one of the main investors in Tesla, it does not um, value Tesla as an automotive company. It values Tesla as a mobility company. So what is a mobility company? Eventually, the driverless vehicle, uh, cars will come to you from an app, pick you up, take you where you want to go, and pick the next person up, and just keeps on doing this, right? So the, the, uh, the, the study that was done in America, 475 million cars, 475 million cars or thereabout, becomes 45 million mobility vehicles, okay? Because out of six of us today, only one mobility vehicle is needed to ferry us about. Okay? So what happens then? So here, let me extrapolate to you what a 4.0 scenario is. So today we are producing cars in, like, say, Shah Alam, right? Maybe 20,000, 30,000 cars a month. That's the TIV, right? With mobility vehicle that drops down to maybe 15% of that number. There's an entire supply chain that relies on 40, 30, 40,000 cars coming up the, value, the, the assembly line every month. When it drops down to maybe less than 6,000 cars a month, what kind of industry is that? It's a completely different industry. It is not the same industry anymore. So the automotive industry today uh, employs uh, 700,000 workers. 700,000 workers. The mobility industry <laughs> will be a lot less. So, um, so one of the ladies that came up uh, on the lift uh, today was uh, she. She was saying she was trying to explain to her kids that you know, you might not have a job in the future, right? And <laughs> I think that's what she meant, right? But the point is this: you may not have the same job that's here today. It'll be a completely different job, right? So. Um, uh, engineer on the fully automated line is not the same as a technician on a mass production line. Right? The skill sets are completely different. I'm building an autonomous factory at the moment, should be ready by the end of the year, uh, and that factory will be looking at demonstrating and supporting small medium enterprises into automation. Okay? So um, in agriculture, you see now drones being used. Right? So there's a large application of drones, and the whole idea behind that is to create 
bigger, uh, sorry, greater productivity of the crops, right? So in here now you find that uh, the uh, the drones are inspecting the crops, telling you where to put the fertilizers and so on and so forth. Now they're beginning to get technologies to extract the crops as well. They're picking drones and so on and so forth. And the whole idea is to reduce the dependence on labor, right? Now um, when we started this work, which maybe uh, five years ago, i.e. pre-pandemic, uh, the projections were for a lot of this 4.0 to be things that we have to deal with 15, 20 years from now. Okay? So what the pandemic has done, it has brought everything forward to about a five-year horizon. The impact of something like that is quite tremendous because the entire supply chain that has to support that must now be able to cope with that level of technological advancement. So one of the aircraft I was involved with um, uh, in uh, starting 2018 was the A350. So the A380 came and then A350, which is your fully composite aircraft. So the whole aircraft was made out of carbon fiber, right? Uh, and in Malaysia, this is the stuff that we make in Malaysia, everything in red, on different aircraft. So hope you feel proud next time you get on a plane, an A320 Air Asia aircraft, right? For Air Asia aircraft, everything uh, on the back of the wing there, okay, my pointer is not clear. But everything on the back of the wing there that controls the uh, movement of the aircraft, that's all designed and built in Malaysia. So without Malaysia, the plane can only fly in a straight line. Right? And it's single source. That means nobody else in the world makes those parts. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> so, I think... Um, uh, this kind of uh, capability is important because um, the level of integration you see, all these companies, Malaysian companies, have with the global supply chain is, uh, is quite immense, right? Because we basically are, there are 6 million parts, for example, on an A350. 6 million parts. Every part down to the smallest screw, if the aircraft were to crash, and it's because of that screw, you should be able to trace that screw from to the, to the uh, uh, mine where the material came from. That's the level of traceability you need in order for you to have an aircraft that can fly for 25 plus years. You need to know. Everything about the plane, you need to know, right? So this, is, this kind of uh, technological uh, capability is only mirrored in things like medical devices, right? something familiar to you all, yeah? uh, nuclear devices, right? And I think you'll see so many medical people here, right, uh, or from that fraternity, fraternity. You understand what that means, right? The ability to rely on this equipment and the build and the design of this equipment, right? So once you stick, my mother-in-law just had a total knee replacement, right? So it's gone in, that's it, it's not coming out, right? It better work first time, right? So this is the same kind of thinking that goes behind the aerospace, the aircraft, right? As opposed to consumer electronics, for example, your phone, you know, every two years, you will recycle the phone, right? It goes back into, I don't know, into the drawer and then you buy a new one because it's run out of battery or whatever, right? So this kind of cycle, typically the reliability of the components is not the same level as what you would find in aerospace or medical devices and such like. Okay. So, uh, Malaysian Aerospace then, some stuff that's running out. It's a more than a 50-year-old industry. We started with maintaining planes in the uh, 19, in early 70s. Uh, then we make composite parts, so that's people actually laying up carbon fiber to build parts of the aircraft, right? From the wing parts, the, the fuselage parts, and the engine components. Um, and then the metal parts are made in Sungai Buloh, not very far from uh, not very far from KL. Um, that's my company doing design of aircraft components and the Spirit Aero System. So this is the A350. You see this lady with the tudong. She's now riveting the the leading edge of the A350. So the front of the whole wing is manufactured in Subang. Right? So that's, that's being shipped. And then uh, here you have Airbus Customer Services. So Airbus Customer Services maintains all of the Airbus fleet of aircraft. There are only uh, four centers in the world. There's one in Toulouse, which manages all of Europe. There's one in America that manages all of the Americas. Uh, and the European one goes all the way up to uh, Russia, I think. There's an Airbus customer services, China, just manage China. And Kuala Lumpur manages everyone else. So Abu Dhabi, uh, uh, Saudi, right, uh, India, all of that is managed through KL. And what does that mean? 
any issues of the aircraft in service, an engineer from Sepang is there to sort it out. Okay, it's uh, 200, 200 plus engineers in Airbus Customer Services Malaysia. Now, Airbus Customer Services Malaysia is also part of Airbus's Skywise system. And the Skywise system, let me bring you back to that slide just now. This one down here, you can't see it. The Skywise system is a big data system. Right? So it is done by Palantir. I'm not sure if some of you might be familiar with Palantir. And what it's trying to do now is connect the data that's coming from the aircraft in flight. So every A320 aircraft has more than 40,000 data points. 40,000 sensors picking up information from the aircraft and is shipping it down to Asia headquarters Red Q in, uh, in uh, Sepang. Then that information is also being fed into the maintenance uh, operator and the maintenance operator's information of what's happening with the aircraft is also being fed into the Palantir system. Now we are also now linking the manufacturing supply chain into that. So you have the manufacturing, the, uh, the operations, and then the maintenance all on a large big data system. Okay. So the idea behind this is to learn as much as possible about the aircraft in service, uh, in manufacture, in maintenance, so that you can get to a point where you will reduce the timeline which it takes to design an aircraft. Today it takes about 10 to 12 years from the first day that you come up with the idea and you sell it to the airline. So aircraft are what you call build and then sell. Right? So build and sell. That means, so it's uh, sell and then build, like a house. Right? You take the order and then they'll give you your house in two years. The same thing with the aircraft. They will sell the aircraft uh, in advance. Um, the, uh, you get enough orders and then they will start to design and build the plane. Okay? That point from when they decide to design and build the plane to the time the aircraft actually takes off, the first aircraft entry into service, EIS aircraft takes off, is about 10 to 12 years. So it's a very long process to get one product off the line. What Airbus is trying to do now is to reduce that time to maybe five to seven years. Right? That's a tremendous leap in terms of information, right? Because the reason it takes 10 to 12 years is because you design, uh, you go through loops, you know, you try the first one, doesn't work, the second one doesn't work, third one doesn't work, then you build a test product and then you test it, first one doesn't work, second one doesn't work, third one doesn't work, it goes on and on and on for 10, 12 years before the final one, ready for manufacture, is off the line. To shorten all of that, they're using big data. Right? So, Airbus itself is trying to figure out how this is going to work in realizing those aircraft. And uh, when I worked on the A350, um, when they decided to design this new aircraft, the way that they do it is that they throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. Okay? So, originally, it's uh, just you know, make it a more composite aircraft, carbon fiber. Do you know what carbon fiber is? Yeah? Carbon fiber? So carbon fiber is uh, basically that black stuff that supercars are made out of, right? So carbon fiber. Um, so an aircraft today mostly is made from aluminium, right? Which is metal. So to make the whole fuselage out of carbon fiber is uh, the equivalent um, process of making furniture, right? So plywood, right? You're layering plywood, and then you put glue, 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 and then you make a thick piece of plywood, right? So that's the plywood deck. Carbon fiber is the same. You put layers and layers and layers of carbon fiber, and that builds up the fuselage of the A350. And the fuselage of the A350, actually, if you look at it in a cross-section, I took some uh, lecturers from UniKL to uh, Toulouse to see it. And the first time these guys, they were maintenance engineers, saw it, this huge, uh, I think, four-meter diameter sort of uh, circumference, and that thick of carbon fiber keeping the passengers away from the atmosphere, right? That's all between you and the atmosphere, okay? That's a big deal, <laughs> because not only is that all that's there, that's the first time we've ever done it. Prior to that, it was all made of metal, okay? So what do I mean by everything in the kitchen sink? So I must say, since we're going to go so far with that, we'll change the electronics of it, we'll change the uh, systems inside it, We'll change even the way we design it and change all the programming methods. They change everything. And then they said, okay, we do it all at one go because it's going to take us 10 to 12 years to do the next one. Okay? So what happens then in the supply chain is that everybody is just asked to develop new capabilities overnight. So I, for example, uh, at Strand, we had to make an invest. We had to decide within, I think, a three-month period 
to make a $1.5 million investment in new software. Overnight. Within three months, if you don't have this new software, change all your software, you can't bid on the project. You know? That was a requirement. So at that point also, a lot of the uh, companies out of Bangalore, out of Pune, out of Chennai, the Indian engineering services companies, they grew very fast because they also had a back end of software. Right? They invested very fast in all the software development and through that software development, they won a lot of contracts. So it wasn't necessarily built on, on, on a heritage of aerospace uh, capability, but on the ability to address an IT problem. So this is, this is interesting, right, if you think about it. Right? The kind of things that will drive decision making going forward. Because I'm going to bring you back to the government and economics. Right? So how is it that we are going to be able to cope with such changes when corporations themselves are in this quandary of exactly where is it that we will be going, who will we be competing with, right? The largest uh, drone services com company in the world is a Malaysian company. Right? The company is called Aerodyne. Um, Aerodyne, about eight years ago or seven years ago, was a 10 or 12 man company. Aerodyne makes trans website. That's how I know the CEO of Aerodyne, Kamaru. He's now on the board of Bank Negara also. Right? It was a six, seven man company and they were making websites. Right? And they were using drones to take the footage and so on and so forth. But Kamaru is a very inventive person. He's an accountant, not an engineer. Right? So what, what degree is going to get you into what profession? Who's to say? Right? So he is now leading the world's largest drone services company. He's in 26 different countries at last I counted. So he does everything from uh, provide inspections on uh, Tanaga National uh, uh, pylons to wind turbines in Scotland and Chile. Right? So if you go to his HQ in Cyberjaya, you will see uh, Malaysian engineers getting data from all over the world, different types of assets, producing maintenance reports and submitting those to the different countries which they are in. Okay, just imagine, right? Inspecting a uh, telecommunications tower. You'd see a little lorry come, right? With three people in it, yeah? The driver, the guy with the ladder, and the guy who's taking the notes, right? Okay, so they come to the, uh, to the tower, put up the ladder, the guy will come up, the, one guy will go up the ladder, take the photos, come down, another guy will write the report, then they go to the next tower. Take 45 minutes maybe per tower and they've got hundreds of those, right? Maybe they charge, I don't know, 100 ringgit per telecommunications tower, right? So, uh, yeah, I think, don't worry about it, just leave it, I'll, I'll go with it, yeah. So, um, so now, what did Aerodyne do, right? Aerodyne used the drone to take the photos. So what did it replace, yeah? It replaced the ladder. That was the first disruption that it did. It replaced the ladder. Okay, so now it can go and fly a hundred, probably, uh, sorry, maybe 50 um, uh, poles at the same time it took to do one pole by a truck. Okay, so now how can Aerodyne charge for that? Yeah, today it's 100 ringgit, right? Anything less than 100 ringgit is good value, correct? So remember Joseph Schumpeter before? Creative disruption, right? So now Aerodyne says, maybe my cost is only 30 ringgit, but I can still charge 80, right? It's 20 ringgit, less, 20% discount, the guy will go for it, okay? Then slowly, other companies started doing the same service, then charge 70 ringgit, then charge 60 ringgit, then charge 50 ringgit. Slowly, the margins are being squeezed out, yeah? But I say slowly, actually, it's within two, three years this begins to happen, okay? So now Aerodyne invests in artificial intelligence. So the drones that they fly today have got AI on the drones. And what does the AI do? The first thing the AI did was this. You just say, here's a bunch of uh, um, poles. Please fly and tell me what's wrong with them. Right? So the drones will fly. It would decide what, what parts of the, uh, the, the pole is uh, rosa, right? is, is, is not serviceable. Take the photo, create the report, send it back. So now he's replaced all three people on the front end. 
Before it was just the guy in the ladder, right? Because still you had the guy taking the photo, deciding what photos to take. Now there's no more human being deciding what photo to take, right? So where is this business model going to at the end of the day? It is actually going towards a total asset management service model, right? And maybe in the next few years, it will not be a drone anymore. So one of the things that people are training for today is remote, pilot, uh, remote drone pilot training, right? Because now you have all these drones flying, you have to be trained, right? At the same time, Camarol and other guys are investing millions of ringgit in developing AI to fly the drones autonomously. They reckon within five to six years, most of the drones will be flown as a swarm. They'll come up like a swarm of bees, come up from a box, and they will go across, and they will go and figure out what they have to do and come back with the information, send it back to base, right? And then there'll be an automated AI that does the analysis, okay? So with that kind of technology development that he's doing now, he's no longer a drone company, he's already a data company. And that's actually the direction of Aerodyne. So what started as a drone company is now a data company, right? Probably five years from now, I reckon they're fully a data company already. Right? By the time they go, uh, they're NASDAQ listing, which is where they're probably going to go. Right? The key thing now, if you look at all of this is, the training school that trained the pilots, Air Asia has just launched its remote pilot training organization uh, training school. In five years of time, they may not have students to train, right? That skill set may not be required anymore, right? I suppose in the medical field is this whole thing about robotic surgery, right? How much of surgery may be replaced by robots, you know? So I think, uh, yeah, so I see my friend Rahal here. <laughs> Who's a heart surgeon? Uh, you know, I think it's heart, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I think uh, when I was young, you had the cardiothoracic surgeon, right? So the guy who would crack the chest, get into the heart, start it again, and then put it back in, right? Something to that effect. And then later on, you had all this angioplasty and so on and so forth, and you get the plumbers, right? They just go through your veins and so on, and do most of it, and then replace almost all the cardiothoracic surgeons, which are now a rare breed. So that same kind of disruption now happening at an exponential curve um, with all other technologies like drone. Okay. So where is the economic foundation of the country going forward? I think that is the question that today from the Central Bank of Malaysia to the Economic Planning Unit, down to the Ministry of International Trade, down to the Ministry of Science, all of them are asking this question. They put up these plans because we need a plan you don't have a plan, there's no direction. And the whole idea is then to say, everybody, let's try and work in this direction and hopefully we will be able to see as things progress, where is it that we're going and where, what is it that we will be good at. Right? And underlying all of this very heavy element, despite all the automation, is people. The number one requirement when I, uh, when I entertain any sort of foreign direct investor coming into Malaysia trying to get into aerospace development here, they, they bring a product, they say, okay, we want to produce this. Uh, I did it for, for example, UMW. UMW makes cars. <clears throat> I was a tur turnkey consultant. They became a tier one supplier to Rolls-Royce. So if you go down to Surinda, you will see the case of the engine, right, which holds uh, the whole of the engine for the, uh, for the uh, 787 and the 7, uh, 7, 787 and the A330. Right, made in Surinda, 4,000 parts titanium. Now, UMW was never an aerospace company. It went into aerospace within two years of signing a contract, which I helped negotiate. So, from that point, now they have capabilities and technologies which are forcing them into different directions of business, and hopefully that will allow them to cope with the changes in the automotive industry as well. Right. So this kind of skills, now, when I was doing that also, one of the biggest problems was that none of the skill sets, the 22 different skill sets associated with uh, this product, none of them were in Malaysia to the level that's required. We had welders, but we didn't have the welders for titanium aerospace. We had quality managers, but we didn't have Rolls-Royce standard quality managers, right? We had uh, material scientists, but not Rolls-Royce standard material, uh, material engineers, right? So all of these skill sets, we had to design new training programs and we had to put it together in combina combination with several different institutions. Because not one institution could deliver it, and half of them were delivered abroad. So, 
we then started on the process of localizing these capabilities so that UMW can continue producing engineers that can then support this product into service. Right? So, um, in the last of uh, five minutes here, right? What I wanted to show was, uh, so yeah, this, yeah. So these are very uh, granular sort of uh, information on what is the problem with uh, our SMEs. I was on the news, I think, two weeks ago, uh, talking about this. Um, and if you look at, these are um, capabilities of what you call a machine, a machining company, right? A machining company is one that takes a block of metal, puts it in a machine and cuts maybe 70% of the metal away and you get a product, right? So that is the basic skill sets required to make a lot of the parts on a plane, right? Or anything, right? So electronics industry and so on and so forth. You open up your mobile phone, you see little tiny metal parts which are all in different shapes, right? That is made by the machining process. So when we look at all the cost items associated with the machining process from the hours, the man hours, the material cost, the utilities, logistics, we find a whole bunch of challenges here which are effectively to do with low knowledge base, right? So the guys who are now producing for maybe um, the mobile phone industry, I cannot use them for the aerospace or high-end medical devices industry. They don't have all the quality requirements or all the skill sets that's required. So these gaps now are across all of our SMEs, right? So when we look at transforming SMEs towards being able to provide us what is 30% of our economy today, manufacturing, right? It's 30% of the nation economy. It's actually a very big challenge. It's a humongous challenge, actually, now that the government faces. And post-COVID, you find that now without the foreign workers, there is a major labor shortage. There are nearly 30,000 um, technicians needed in the next two years in Penang alone. 30,000 technicians needed because the electronics industry is booming, right? And our government's policy right now is to try to halt the foreign, uh, the low, low, low skill foreign labor from coming in, right? And only have high skill people in the country. But in the interim, you have an issue. You still need the low, low cost foreign labor to do the work while you try and get your SMEs to automate and become and resolve all of these issues. So you are stuck in a conundrum now as a government, right? So in between this is where we sit as a country, right? We have the potential, like today I'm in Mahsa College, you know, we have 450 higher education institutes in the country. I think we have the largest education infrastructure in probably the whole of Southeast Asia, right? Nobody has more institutions than higher learning and education institutions, right? Um, but we also have a very big problem of graduate employability. Right. So I know employment is high, but employability is a different <laughs> is a different thing altogether, right? So when we look at these kind of problems now, actually we face something which is a conundrum that we can produce people, but we're not producing exactly the right people, which is a good problem in a way. We're somewhere in between, right? We have the capacity, but we need to tailor the delivery. And I can tell you that is where our economy today sits. Our ability to deliver those people when they are needed for when does all those transformation industries happen that's what institutions like Masa I think the challenge that you have is to time that and deliver that on demand right so I've been working on a few uh, programs on that um, and the last thing I'll say about that is this it's all about skills and competences right so certifications and degrees and diplomas people's the, you know the pieces of paper that you get those are useful, but the thing that the industry will be asking you for is your skill and competence, right? So, you will not trust the doctor that's not gone through what is the medical apprenticeship program, right? They have to have done it. If they've not done it, then you're not going to let them into your body, right? So, I think uh, what's interesting about the medical profession is that it's been an apprenticeship methodology forever. It's never changed. But engineering has not. It's changed to become basically a degree type program, right? And a lot of the apprenticeship, the learning on the job has depleted over the years. And in Malaysia, the problem is that there's not enough industry to support. So there is a challenge there, I think, that um, all institutions are facing now. And I can tell you that it's the major issue now for economic growth, right? We are targeting, today we are just under 1 trillion 
uh, GDP, ringgit GDP, US dollar, sorry, GDP. The idea is to get to 2030, uh, 2035, I think, and hit a two and a half trillion economy. Two and a half trillion. That's Bank Negara's target, right? So we're going to more than double our economy. Now, the idea behind that is simple. If you don't do that, then you might not be relevant because Vietnam and Thailand and all would have caught up with you, right? Indonesia is coming up thick and fast, yeah? So it is a race for survivability at the moment. No, I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but I can tell you, being at the front with all those organizations that I'm with, the pain is real. The pain at the front is real. It is happening. Um, and we need every Malaysian to be doing his part, right? And we're hoping some foreign uh, foreigners will also be part of our journey as well. Okay, so I'm hitting 4.15 exactly there uh, with my half cut slide. <laughs> so maybe it might be best to invite some questions in the last 15 minutes. Can I, can I do that? Yes, let's yeah. move into Q&A now. Yes. Uh, Dr. Iman. Okay, uh, thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Of course, it's the IR 4.0 and the new technologies and development is the biggest challenge nowadays. I, I would like, I, I want to hear from you because you are part of the person, the committee that you develop the policy. So for sure, in this current uh, era, so the changing the policy and defining the policy is the biggest challenge for the government, of course. So I want to see how often in this uh, fast developing uh, era, how often you def define and you change your policy, and I think it's very important how this uh, situation like the current pandemic affect on this uh, changing policy. I, I believe you must changing policies nowadays even monthly. <laughs> and as an education person, as a person in the academic area, so how, how you are working with academic to make sure they are capable with the, um, they are fixed in your policy changing and how you are happy with the current education and how you want to work and make sure that education is fit into your uh, changing policies regularly. Yeah. And the final one I want to know that, of course, uh, uh, for the future, we definitely so many automations and so many new technology come. So we expect that the cost also become lower. But on the other hand, the cost become higher and higher. So what are the... Uh, a struggling point that you face for changing policy, the cost, and also the, how education can be fit in your changing policy. Okay, okay. I'll stop you there before you ask the fourth question. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, first thing, how often do I change policy? Uh, uh, three prime ministers already, right? So, that's three policy changes. Right. <laughs> I'm only half joking there because it's true. <laughs> so, uh, unfortunately, uh, the biggest change of policy tends to be change of government. Okay? Now, what's good about the plans that I showed you just now, the 4.0 uh, uh, policy framework, and the... Uh, so if you write a good policy, you shouldn't have to change it. It should be in it that it is adaptable. Right? So what they have done in here is, one major thing is that they've created inter-ministerial committees. Now that's, that's, that's very difficult to do, because generally, uh, ministries are like faculties. Uh, that maybe that, that you, you feel that immediately, right? <laughs> faculties are siloed. <laughs> ministries are siloed, right? They don't. They rather not cross over between each other, right? So to create interministerial collaboration, they created interministerial committees, and uh, with the key ones like the 4.0 uh, policy framework, which is the My Digital Committee, that is chaired by the Prime Minister. So the ultimate decision maker sits like, sits there. So they won't change the policy they will see what is happening in the implementation of the policy and adjust the implementation. So if the policy is written well enough by PricewaterhouseCoopers and, and uh, by people like myself, then you don't have to change the policy, you just have to change the implementation strategies. Okay, so that's the policy. Um, how, uh, how does cost um, work now? So I think the key thing you have to focus on is the service economy. Everything is going to AAS, S as a service, whether it's software as a service, manufacturing as a service, health as a service, right? What is that? What does that mean? That means everything is provided to you by a subscription model. So I think my favorite example is uh, Koei, right? I think you find it the most insulting business model ever. 
they put between me and my water supply that I already paid for a machine that charges me for my own water. Right? <laughs> and every subscription I put in there, apart from the lady who comes and does the service every three, every quarter, all the money goes to Korea. <laughs> so that's a brilliant business model to think about it, right? And you don't own that machine, right? It's on lease. It is part of a cyclic economy. They can take it back and then they can recycle it, give you a new one, right? So they can actually have sustainability built into their, their business model. They're now doing it for beds, right? So Kowei now does beds. Maybe every three years, they will change your bed. Every four months, they will wash your bed. They will clean your bed, right? And then they'll show you how disgusting it is so you'll never buy a bed and not clean it again, right? So you go for Kowei forever and ever and ever, right? So this as a service business model, like I mentioned with the cars, with mobility. What will happen is that you will not be paying for the asset anymore. You'll be paying for the service. And you have platforms. And if you look at the top companies in the world, they're all platform companies, right? It's all about giving fractional value, giving the value at a fraction of the cost to many people. So that's the business model. How can institutions keep up? Uh, I think you are in one of the most challenging 4.0 industries. The most challenging. Because everybody's asking the question, should I spend these three years? Right? And when I come out, will I have the job that I started thinking about when I started? So I think what I found is the private institutions have an advantage because you are, your board is more focused on that. You don't have a lot of the other governance that uh, public universities might have. Um, and you're able to evolve. And you're driven by making sure that you have a sustainable business model. Right? So I think first your business model um, at least in terms of how it's structured is correct, right? What is the problem now is the products. I think the products are very, very critical. I think micro-credentials are going to be very, very important, absolutely important, because you're going to have to allow people to come in and out. Um, and the other thing is that uh, your relationship with industry and the challenge you have, I sit on the board of studies for maybe seven different universities, right? <coughs> Including now the Asian School of Business. So, um, uh, the idea now is that you must have industrial partners that are worthy of what you're trying to do. The issue of going out there and just finding a factory to work with is that that factory could be 60% low-cost labor, 70% low-cost labor. They don't have a technology problem. Yeah? They have a labor problem. And if you're going in there trying to do technology research and all that, they don't have the, the, the thing that needs to be solved. So you must find partners, like you know, when you're in Toulouse in Abbas, for example, the university is across the road from Airbus, right? That's where all the real problems are being, uh, being done. So I think you will have to reach out for technical uh, subjects, I know. Um, you need to reach out for uh, global partnerships, maybe with companies, right? So I know, you've, you know in IT, you've got Microsoft and, and a few others. So I think that's the step in the right direction. But that will be the biggest challenge, to be relevant to industry that you you actually have a relationship with that means something to what you're doing. Okay, thank you so much. And um, anyway, anyway, we are glad that at Massa, I think everyone's aware, we are working hard on micro credentials. And now we are one of the pioneers in Malaysia with more than 1,000 programs in micro credentials. So it's good. Thank you so much for your answer. Uh, so we are open for the uh, answer, question and answer here. If any of uh, participants can have any question, please let us know. Anyone from engineering faculty here? <laughs> Any other faculties rather than engineering? You want to get what? How is aerospace and IR 4.0 affected on your area? Medical, perhaps business. Yes, please. Hi. It's, uh, it could be an irrelevant question. Sir. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no irrelevant questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, myself, Ashutosh, I'm a lecturer in pharmacy. So definitely, I do not have much idea about aerospace. Uh, this was like one of the most deepest I could know is today. <laughs> so uh, on a lighter note, just would like to ask, uh, when you were mentioning about that um, getting some cracks and things, how many percentage of chances are there? <laughs> I had the same thought in my head. What's the percentage of the chances that uh, 
an aircraft can fall down in the, from the air. <laughs> It's a bad time to say something convincing because I think just a month ago the China Airlines aircraft went nose down, right? <laughs> but actually we work to probabilities of more than 10 to the power of 9. Uh, right? So it's more than 10 to the power of 9. It's 9 to 12. 10 to the power of 9 to 10 to the power of 12. Probability of something not happening. Okay? So that's the level of probability. So there's a lot of what you call conservatism. Hence why aerospace is very challenging. You're supposed to make something very light, very efficient, but very robust and very resilient. Right? So these are what you call diametrically opposed requirements. You know? So it builds a certain kind of people. I notice aerospace people everywhere in the world, they behave the same way. They are, you find the community, it doesn't matter, Indian, Indonesian, Dutch, whatever, we sit around the table, and suddenly we just talk the same language. And I think it's, it's great, you know? I think technology has that ability to unify uh, people in a certain language. But that, that's what we are. We all work at 10 power of 9, you know? And we have very efficient conversations about how to make sure that that keeps going. So you're safe in the air. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Actually, we are happy that we have engines like you. And it was very impressive when you told that Malaysia produced some part of aircraft, which is only produced in Malaysia. It's very good that we are happy that we live in Malaysia. Okay, okay one you. last one. Maybe a student. Oh my God, come on, 4.0 guys. <laughs> <laughs> one more question, please. I don't think I'm that scary. Are there you? Yes, please. <laughs> Somebody give her a mic. Oh, unless yes. you can speak from there. <laughs> ah, you want to lift with me? Yes. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to know, I mean, not much familiar with the government policies over here. So, um, in, in case, let's say, it, let be a student or a youngster comes up with some innovative idea or creative yeah. idea um, regarding application of this digital technology into their form or kind of discipline. What, what, how is the government supporting or what kind of uh, support they get to further startups uh, to be promoted? Any information on that? Yes, so um, you have a few organizations um, which have incubators. So I think the Multimedia Development Corridor has got an incubator uh, or that kind of function. The programs, funded programs. SME Corporation also has some. So depending on what kind of startup, right? Um, whether it's uh, software or tech. Um, now I'm working with Maranti. Maranti is uh, what is the combination of magic before and the technology partnership. So there I'm helping them develop their uh, their their programs for entrepreneurs. Um, it's a tough one because uh, we found that a lot of the entrepreneurship is social. So um, we don't have enough deep technology entrepreneurship in Malaysia because we don't have enough high tech industry. So I think this, uh, what I find the problem with is a lot of the programs funded are for markets which are within Malaysia. That means we're selling to each other, right? We're not really exporting. So that, that is a challenge. So, and then a lot of the very fast-growing tech companies go to Singapore after they've you know, grown uh, far enough. So there's a lot of programs that the government has at the moment uh, for startups. But at the university level, I think you probably need to... I, I would suggest that you engage directly with the ministries if you can, um, like Ministry of Science, Technology, and then uh, the Ministry of International Trade. Right? Um, their programs are appearing all the time. During COVID, several programs... Uh, came up and they allocated budgets, you know, and there's billions allocated to, to these kind of things. So there's a lot of opportunities, you know, if it's just 100,000, 200,000 sort of number, I don't know whether it's big or small, but for us it would be small, but for a startup it would be reasonable, then that would be the kind of budgets that are generally available. Anything between 50 to 100, 150,000, there are quite a few programs uh, for that. But you need, uh, I don't know if you have a government engagement unit here, uh, but that might be helpful to work on this. And the, what you need to know is that the government, in its implementation, creates its programs regularly. So you have to kind of get on it while you know their programs are, are there. Yeah. So it's a bit general, but that's what happens in practice. <laughs> <laughs>